Well, uh, every month I find new poetry books. Uh, they come in, you know, from one source or another. I keep wanting to keep reading one that I've already started and keep reading out of that, but I just can't help it. Uh, three of them came in that I just have to read from. I'm going to read two short ones from each book. I'm going to just pick them at random, like I normally do. I actually may start at the front and just do the first couple. The first one, which is the newest, is a book from a book called My Pen is My Pulpit. Mm -hmm. And uh, story, story Poems of Inspiration and Country Humor is the, sub, the uh, subtitle. And the man who, whose poetry it is, it, his name was Earl Duck, D-U-C-K, <laughs> an, an American preacher poet. Uh, this book was published after his death. Uh, his wife said he wrote over 600 poems, obviously not 600 in here. Uh, just a little brief history of Mr. Duck. He was born in Biloxi, Mississippi in 1925. He was raised along the Gulf Coast between Mississippi and Mobile, Alabama. He served in the Navy from 43 to 46 and from 50 to 54, serving both in World War II and Korea. He attended F Florida Baptist schools in Lakeland, Florida, became a Baptist minister in 1970, and spent many years as a pastor until his health forced him to give up his pulpit. He served the Lord by writing approximately 600 poems. Those he considered, some of his best have been collected in this book. He lived in Mount Vernon, Texas, 10 years at the time of his death in May 2000. And uh, so I'm going to read a couple of poems. Uh, from that, I'm going to start with the one on the back of the book, which is the title of the book. My pen is my pulpit. Sometimes people have ideas, even I do once in a while. So as you read what I have written, you may have a tear or a smile. Someone asked me, how do you write? Is there, is there a particular vein? My answer is, I write in arteries also. <laughs> then I start all over again. <laughs> Writing is more than a pastime. It's something I like to do. I hope that as you read my words, it'll be a joy to you. If one of these poems pleases you, then it satisfies my soul. If I entertain or cause you to think, then I have reached my goal. Uh, and I'm just going to... Uh, Skip all of the. Go down. You do the right one someday. It's going to be from a Methodist preacher. Maybe. Poem. Yeah, yeah, yeah we, need, we need a Methodist representative here, too. You have to find a poetry book by the Methodist representative. <laughs> you know how these Baptists have an upper hand. <laughs> this, is a book of, this is a poem about poetry. I like to write, and I frequently do. Rhyming poetry is my style. I write about different subjects. Some bring tears, some a smile. To me, a typewriter is like a brush, except I paint with ink. I don't use canvas like an artist. I just write what I think. <laughs> my typewriter didn't cost a lot, but for me, it works very well. When, I sit down, when we sit down together, then we have a story to tell. We can write about so many things, heaven, hell, even politicians who make our, who can make our money disappear faster than the best magicians. So in order to get my point across, I draw words instead of paint. I'm grateful to you for buying my book, and please don't think that I ain't. <laughs> it's funny, because Jory Sherman, when he wrote, he said he painted with words, too. It's, it's a mess. Yeah. Who am I? My, ner my name is Earl Duck, and I wish I could sing, because there's a song in my heart. I'm a child of the king. I'm still saved today, and will still be tomorrow. I'll praise him in joy, and I'll praise him too in sorrow. He's the Lord of my life, and heaven's my goal. I thank you, dear Jesus, for saving my soul. I've trusted your word. I know that it's true. One day, dear Lord, I'll be in heaven with you. All right. And he is. Now I'm going to try to 
Okay, 37B21. So the next one, this is called Spur Jingles. And it's by Frank Mackey. Frank, yeah, Frank Mackey. Uh, Frank Mackey was published in Dallas in 1937. Uh, I dedicate this book to two that may seem passing strange. The man who knows the open sky, the horse that knows the range. That's his dedication. <laughs> and I'm just going to read his introduction here because it, it's a kind of a poem. It's not a poem. Not a whooping, dust-covered, shouting cowpoke of a silver screen, always rescuing, rescuing some fair damsel from distress. Not the booted and spurred ten-gallon hatted crooner of the radio, but the simple, honest, hard-working cowhand of today who goes about his tasks without trumpet blaring because it is his job, his range, his horse, and his cattle I have tried to picture. An old Comanche Indian told me many of the secrets of the wild folk. He unknowingly sowed the seed that produced these true pictures of range life. He it was who he it was who told me the meaning of wadi and that it stood for rope rider. Will, will that title, so typical of the West, and these pen sketches make the range live for you? I'm just going to read the first couple in the order that they were published in here. There are, there are lots of them. Uh, they're alphabetical, so <laughs> there's no favorites here. Uh, actually, they're, they're in the book, they're in the contents alphabetically, they're not they're printed alphabetically. And I'll just read the first two. The uh, first one is called Wealth, as in money. <laughs> I'm just a traveling wadi, and some say I'm better dead. Most any place is home sweet home, so that I know I'm fed. Give me room in a bunk in the bunkhouse that is free from bugs and fleas, a rope my hands can handle, and a hoss between my knees. I'm used to wind and sandstorms, I can wash my only shirt when it gets too darn sweaty or gets plastered up with dirt. The running waters of the branch clean underwear for me. I hold the herd while my clothes dry. There's no one there to see. The boss, he gives me makings, and I breakfast, dine, and sup. And every day I'm working why my wage is piling up. I own my saddle and my spurs, my chaps and blankets too. The richest jasper in these parts, that's me, I'm telling you. I own the gold that's in the sun and in the afterglow. I own the purple in them hills that in the evenings show. The silver of the moon I own, and when them bright stars shine, they wink and blink and say, howdy and then I know they're mine. My pants is somewhat raggedy, raggedy, need patches on the knees. Shucks, I don't care, for I don't own the perfume of the breeze. I'm hard as nails and mighty tough. I know I own my health. I ain't got no book learning, friend, but tell me, ain't that wealth? <laughs> okay, this is called Th those 10 gallon hats and it's, it's got 1836 to the left and 1936 to the right and I don't know what that means <laughs> maybe it'll tell me when the, in the poem <laughs> okay uh, and this is another short poem you think of the breeze on the prairie you think of the wind on the plain you can hear the thunder of hoofbeats you can feel the sting of the rain spurs jingle on heels of the wearers who know not the meaning of spats, I write of the men with a swagger, those owners of 10-gallon hats. This year they extend you a welcome, these men, they have something to show. For Texas served under six ensigns, and there's only one real Alamo. There are flowers today in that garden that never saw one pair of spats, for the men who died facing an army have produced men with 10-gallon hats. 
Those hats speak of canyons and coolies, of sunsets that bathe lands in gold, of blue bonnets, then of a lone star that this year is a century old. Those hats, they are worn by freelancers who know not the meaning of spats, but who stand for the true type of manhood, and their crowns are those 10-gallon hats. <laughs> Obviously, 1836 was the Alamo. Mm -hmm. <laughs> anyway, those are two from uh, uh, Frank Mackey. Uh, this book was published in 1937, and um, it is signed by Mr. Mackey. <coughs> 1942, when somebody bought it from him. So that's, that's that. And the last one is a guy you probably heard of. Uh, this was uh, published in 1941, I believe. 41. Yeah, 41. And it includes poems from 31 through 40 by a fellow named Ogden Nash. Uh, <laughs> some of you have probably heard of Ogden. I'm just going to read the first two in this book, and then I'll be sending uh, This is called, uh, I, I don't know anything about Ogden. I don't know what kind of poetry he wrote. If it's, uh, if it's off color, I apologize. Uh, like I said, I've not read any of these. Have you read any Ogden Nash? Not enough to remember what he wrote. No, uh, I think it's probably going to be my guess is that he tended to write sort of in a humorous vein. Yeah, that's what I that's By the way, that um, uh, the one you just read out of that 1836 to 1936, I don't know. Do you think 36 uh, was the year of, of the Alamo battle, or what was the year that Texas became a republic? I don't know. I can tell you that right now. Towel. That might be. The Declaration that, of Independence is March the second, eighteen thirty-six. Yeah. So, Texas Declaration. Yeah. Texas Independence so it would be March that would be. Uh, in other words, he's that he that he wrote that he wrote. He wrote that when we became it. Well, he wrote those, or at least it was published in thirty-six, yeah. nineteen thirty-six. Well, that's when that's the. Or, date. or is that just the date on the that's poem? That's the date on the poem. It's, it's, it was so, centenar, cent, centennial. Centennial. The centennial of, of, of becoming a republic. Of the republic, yeah. Became a state in, in 1845. In the yeah, so that that seemed to be uh, more logical. I don't know, Ogden. Anyway, the name of this book is The Face is Familiar. That's the name of the whole book. Say again. The Face is Familiar. Oh. Seven. Um, here. Uh, just for those who have interest, he published in various places, including Cosmopolitan, Harper's uh, Life, uh, The New Yorker, uh, The Saturday Evening Post, and The Saturday Review of Literature, among others. Uh, others that are no longer around. But, uh, Sure, he published in many other places. Anyway, this is uh, this first poem is it's printed all in italics for some reason. Uh, and, um, it's, a, it's a letter. Yes, really. It's written as a, it's written as a letter. It's called Two and One Are a Problem. That's the name of the poem. Dear Miss Dix, I am a young man of half past 37. My friends say I am not unattractive, though to be kind and true is what I have always striven. I have brown hair, green eyes, a sensitive mouth, and a winning natural exuberance, and at the waist, a barely noticeable protuberance. I am open-minded about beverages so long as they are grape, brandy, or malt. And I am generous to practically any fault. Well, Miss Dix, not to beat around the bush, there is a certain someone who thinks I am pretty nice. 
and I turn to you for advice. You see, it started when I was away on the road and returned to find a pair of lovebirds had taken up their abode in my abode. Well, I am not crazy about lovebirds, but I must say they look very sweet in their gilded cage and their friendship had reached an advanced stage. And I had just forgiven her who had, who of the feathered uh, fiancés was the donor of, when the houseboy caught a lost lovebird in the yard that we couldn't locate the owner of. So then we had three, and it was no time for flippancy. Because everybody knows that a lovebird without its own lovebird to love will pine away and die of the discrepancy. So we bought a fourth lovebird for the third lovebird, and they sat around very cozily, beak to beak. And then the third lovebird that we had provided the fourth lovebird with it for to keep it from dying died at the end of the week. So we were left with an odd lovebird, and there was no time for flippancy, because a lovebird without its own lovebird to love would pine away and die of, this, uh, of the discrepancy. <laughs> Sounds like a Groucho Marshall team. Sure <laughs> so we had to buy a fifth lovebird to console the fourth lovebird that we had bought to keep the third lovebird <laughs> contented. And now the fourth lovebird has lost its appetite, and Miss Dix, I am going demented. I don't want to break any hearts, but I got to know where I'm at. Must I keep on buying lovebirds, Miss Dix, or do you think it would be all right to buy a cat? <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Okay. Um, Well, there are a couple of short ones here. Um, You're censoring those as you read them. Oh, uh, yeah. I was <laughs> this is a very short one called The Seagull. Hark to the whimper of the seagull. He weeps because he's not an eagle. Suppose you were, you silly seagull. Could you explain it to your seagull? <laughs> No idea it was so late, is the name of this poem. Consider the man without a watch. He is like soda without scotch. Of the male character, I can quickly give you the gist. It is the reach for his pocket or the glance at the wrist. From the moment they are fledglings, males discipline themselves with timings and schedulings. But they be they lovers, golfers, or railroad engineers, time is the essential ingredient in their careers. And there is nothing more surly than a watchless man who doesn't know whether he is late or early. <laughs> and clocks are no good to him because he can't take them along. And anyhow, a clock is only something that you compare with your watch and find the clock is several minutes wrong. <laughs> If there is one thing that every man thinks how sublime it is, it is to know what time it is. <laughs> Women don't like watches. They feel about them as they do about facial blemishes or blotches. They only tolerate them when they are embedded in brooches or bracelets or belts, or in some way disguised to look like something else. Yes, it's obvious that women don't like them or need them. Because with women's watches, you need a microscope and a map to read them. Time is something they resent, and they fight it with peculiarly feminine resistance. They refuse to acknowledge its existence. In this sexual conflict in attitude toward time, who am I to tip the scales? I only know that more males wait for females than females wait for males. <laughs> I'm gonna let it. Oh. All right, I got three pieces tonight.
Alright, the first one was inspired by They're Coming to Take Me Away by Napoleon <laughs> XIV. That's from 1966. That's way before my time. Way before my but, time. But it's one of my favorite songs. So, <laughs> Anyways, I'm using the structure of it. So. It's called They're Coming to Take Away Our Guns. So, <laughs> so it's uh, comical. So. Well, this uh, is serious. Huh? This is serious. Tragic. Tragic. Yeah. Tragic. <laughs> that's a joke, too. Yeah. Don't tread on me. Yeah, that's right. All right. They're coming away to take. All right. They're coming to take away our guns. Remember when the Second Amendment of the United States of America was actually a privileged right to bear arms and to even overthrow the government with each state's militia if it became tre treasonous. Remember when we could carry our guns either concealed or open, carry, uh, open carried on our hips in our vehicles or in our houses, way before mass sh school shootings, mass concert shootings, mass church shootings, mass waffle house shootings, and mass everything else shootings became a mimicking, never-ending trend in today's society. Remember when the Democrats and liberals wanted to sue the National Rifle Association for enabling people to own whatever guns they wanted to have? And when the Republicans heard this, they laughed. Ha ha, ha ha. <laughs> Remember when the Democrats and liberals wanted to sue and shut down all gun manufacturers? in the United States of America, and when the Republicans heard this, they laughed, he he, ha ha. Remember when the government finally gave in to the Democrats and liberals screaming demands of more extreme gun control laws and even taking all of our guns away? Remember when the government came and knocked down all our, all our doors demanding that we give up our guns while they point their guns in your face and we told them, you can have our guns over our cold dead corpses and good luck finding them you fascist and pinko swine <laughs> and we laughed afterwards <laughs> ha ha he ha 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 remember when the government trashed our houses our sheds our storage buildings our farms our silos our businesses and every habitable and inhabitable buildings on our lands and in our towns cities and metroplexes in order to try and find our guns and take them away from us they were laughing the entire time. Hardy, har, 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 he, he, ha, ha. Remember when the government finished destroying everything we own and felt no remorse about doing it and not finding any of our guns anywhere? And when they, when they realized it was all to no avail, we laughed and laughed and laughed. He, ha, a, ha, 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 he, ba, wa, ba, wa. Remember when the... Oh, okay, I gotta censor that one. Sorry. <laughs> There's a part I'll tell you later. Afterwards, we laughed and laughed and continued laughing until we cried and became and began coughing. He he ha ha, he ha ha ha, hearty har har, ba wah ba wah. That's the end piece. <laughs> so, that was, that was meant to be comical. Thank you. <laughs> so, all right, these two are kind of serious, but uh, I guess you, you could say that. But they're just to make you think, so. Oh, All right, the first one is, why do you believe in dot, dot, dot? Why do you believe in what you believe in? Why do you believe in what you believe in? Oh, hang on, sorry. Why do you believe in what you believe in to be the one true way of thinking and living? Why do you believe in what you believe in and not practice what you preach? Why do you believe in what you believe in and won't nor can't think that maybe you're wrong? Why do you believe in what you believe in and condemn others that don't believe in what you believe in? Why do you believe in what you believe in when someone or something has proven it wrong? Why do you believe in what you believe in when the leader of whatever you believe in has told you his or her interpretation and you haven't even read it to know exactly what it says and you take his or her word to be sacred and truth because he or she said it. Why do you believe in what you believe in? However, you never question its validity, truth, and authenticity. Why do you believe in what you believe in when you don't even know what it is that you believe in? Why do you believe in what you believe in when you disagree with the teachings 
of your sacred leader, but still believe and attend because you're afraid of your parents' disapproval. Why do you believe in what you believe in so much that you invest a certain percentage of your income every week to your place of worship in order to benefit it and your sacred leader whenever you don't see the importance of it? Why do you believe in what you believe in so much that you must share it with everyone by forcing it down their throats and expecting them to convert no matter what? Why do you believe in what you believe in and become irate whenever someone questions your belief system. <clears throat> if you believe in anything, you should definitely know why you believe in it. And it shouldn't be because of other people's approval. <clears throat> or other people's making you by instilling their fear inside of you. That's in peace. Thank you. All right, this one's called, Do You Actually Live dot dot dot? So, it's another thought, this is another thought poem. So, do you actually live in actuality or and not your biased perceived reality? Do you actually live in a fantastical realm? Does your helm steer itself without a nautical compass or drive itself into com comfortability, mundaneness, monotony, and self-fulfilled prophecies? Do you actually even know anything about what is happening in today's society? Or are you too busy living it up in your own world where you are a god or goddess there and everyone there bows down to you? Do you actually care to know any truths at all? Or do you care just to live in your realm of make-believe? Do you actually live in and buy fictitious facts? Do you actually think that you live in a narcissistic world where the universe spin, uh, circles, circles you because, of, because you are the center of it? Do you actually live in and buy outdated ancient fairy tales of epic poems that have been ex exaggerated to the point of being held as something sacred like religions, philosophies, and ideologies? Do you actually think and live by the idea that there is only one true path to living and that yours is that special one way? Do you actually live by actualities rules or by your own fantastical rules? Do you actually live in actuality and not just other people's realities? Do you actually know the difference between actuality and perceived reality? Do you actually live in actualities or just your perceived realities and only living and caring for yourself? Everyone should know the difference between actuality and perceived realities. Everyone should know in which they live in and how to distinguish fantasy from actual factual actualities. That's in peace. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, the Matrix, awesome. Software guys, I don't know about that. Yeah. Now I've got two different poems, one short one and one not, not so, so short. Not, not so, so short. short. <laughs> <laughs> right. Uh, <laughs> last month I brought this book here, but I found another one that I, I tried to sing one time, but it was too long. It took me two days to sing it. Dang. So what was it? It's uh, The Hellbound Train. Oh, yeah. Uh, Glenn Orland has a recording of that. Oh, yeah? I, I run out of breath and... Take two, I, take two days to listen to it. I had to take a lunch break. <laughs> <laughs> but I had another cowboy poem. This was on the cowboy theme. Well, it was. But, uh, this is uh, by Dewey Nixon. It's a cowboy from the Bronx. Oh, gee. Mm. Uh -oh. Uh -oh. <laughs> Ramblin' Jack. He's got sandy hair and steel blue eyes. And dressed in black from head to toe in his mane. Love is a cowboy show. He's a cowboy from the Bronx. He stands tall, straight, and lean. And mean, he sure is a loving machine. He's a cowboy from the Bronx. He loves rattlesnake boots and big Stetson hats. And he's sure hell in my spat. He's a cowboy from the Bronx. He bought a guitar and learned to play. 
He practiced hard night and day. He's a cowboy from the Bronx. <laughs> it took 10 years to become a star, that Bronx cowboy and his guitar. So when you go to a cowboy show and you see a man in black from head to toe, you can bet it's a cowboy from the Bronx. <laughs> <laughs> Who is that by? Dewey yeah. uh, Nixon. Oh. Since we got some New Yorkers in here tonight. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> From the Bronx. <laughs> from the Bronx. Uh -oh. <laughs> and one from the Bronx for sure. Is that uh, an insult or is that a compliment? Uh, a compliment. A compliment, <laughs> right? <laughs> I want to write, write Joe Dan. Yeah. I've been to the Bronx for a while, so I guess I can consider myself <laughs> a short time a Bronx person. Mm -hmm. I, I was going to tell us from the nursing home and all that yesterday when I was over there, but you know they only get a short lunch break. So a short one? A lunch break. Attention span? Yeah, uh, yeah. that too. <laughs> yeah. So I kept them going. But this is called the Hellbound Train. A Texas cowboy lay down on a barroom floor, having drunk so much he couldn't drink anymore. <laughs> so he fell asleep with a troubled brain to dream that he rode on a hellbound train. The engine with the murderous blood and damp and was brilliantly lit with a brimstone lamp. An imp for fuel was shivering, shoveling bones while the furnace rang with a thousand groans. The boiler was filled with lager beer and the devil himself was the engineer. <laughs> the passengers were a most motley crew. Church member, atheists, Gentiles, and Jews. Rich man in broadcloth, beggars in rugs, handsome young ladies, and withered old hags. Yellow and black men, red, brown, and white, all chained together. Oh God, what a sight. I ain't done yet. <laughs> While the train rushed onto an awful pace, the sulfurous fumes scorched their hands and face. Wider and wider the country grew, as faster and faster the engine flew. Louder and louder the thunder crashed, and brighter and brighter the lightning flashed. Hotter and hotter the air became, till the clothes were burnt from each quivering frame. <laughs> and out of the distance there was uh, quite a yell, Ha! Ha! Said the devil, <laughs> we're nearing hell. <laughs> then oh, how the passengers all shrieked with pain, and begged the devil to stop this here train. <laughs> but he, but he camped about and danced for glee, and laughed and joked at their misery. <laughs> My faithful friends, you have done the work, and the devil never can a payday shirk. <laughs> you bullied the work weak, you robbed the poor, the starving brother you turned from the door. You laid up gold for the cankered rust, and have given free vent to your beauty lust. Your justice scorned and corruption sown and trampled the laws of nature's own. You have drunk, rioted, cheated, plundered, and lied and mocked at God and your hell-bound pride. You have paid full fair, so I'll carry you through for it's only right you should have your due. Why the labor also expects his hire, so I'll land you safe in the lake of fire. <laughs> I'm not done yet. Unless the lake. Where your flesh will waste on the flames that roar, and the imps torment you forevermore. <laughs> then the cowboy woke in an anguished cry, his clothes wet with sweat and his hair standing high. <laughs> then he prayed as he never had prayed before. I'll be saved from his sin and the demon's power. 
and his prayers and his vows were not in vain, for he never rode the hell-bound train. <laughs> well, what does that book list an authorship, or does it say traditional, or what? Just traditional. Yeah. Uh, other than just, you know, it's all up in this one yeah. book, so they don't give credit to the author. Sometimes they tell where they heard, where they collected it. Yeah, uh, it's just in there, so that's, I didn't see the reason I didn't want to sing that song. But... <laughs> <laughs> okay. Uh. Okay. Doc can take I get the pictures? I'll do the movie. Can right. I get uh, you to mm -hmm. do the movie of the week here? here. Right. I appreciate it. <sighs> <laughs> Okay. <laughs> got all your stuff there? I got all the stuff. Um, <clears throat> I want to comment um, on a, a kind of an oblique comment on one of Eric's uh, offerings. Um, some of you are familiar with the name Tom Wolf. Mm -hmm. who died mm -hmm. recently. Yeah. You know, he was kind of known as sometimes called the founder of the quote new journalism which supposedly started in the 1960s. Uh, and I know that there's a uh, there was a profile on him in the current issue of Vanity Fair. If any of you are interested, go online and you know Vanity Fair and pull it up. And it's uh, really an interesting, uh, uh, Conrad, if you have to leave, just hand that to Mike. Uh, uh, that is a, uh, I was, I need yeah, it. just hand it down to Mike. Uh, he seems to look to me like he's... Uh, <laughs> you going to switch it over? To be able to have <laughs> <laughs> just, let, just use the mono. Uh, <laughs> In that, he makes a statement, uh, he's, he's quoted, Tom Wolfe is quoted by the writer of that profile as saying that he believes that every decision that any person makes in his life, uh, Let's unless, okay. uh, yeah, what you see in the screen, Eric, is what um, you Yeah, I'm trying to see, yeah, gotcha. Uh, you, you can extend that down as well. Okay. You go all there the way we go. down to the bottom and no, all the way to the bottom. Oh, okay. All right. that and it'll give you a little more flexibility. Uh, all right, then. He said he believes that all of our decisions that we make in life, every single one of them, unless our life is in danger, is based on status. Status. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, what? what we perceive as what's important that, that makes our existence, our reputation, you know, our status in the world. And I found that to be quite thought-provoking. Uh, I'm sort of a fan of Tom Wolfe. I've read just enough of his stuff to, to be impressed. I haven't read anywhere near all of his stuff. Uh, his, he's best known for the book The Right Stuff which was uh, his way of analyzing the, uh, the astronauts uh, back during the day when Chuck Yeager was considered the most righteous possessor of the right stuff. Hmm. And uh, <clears throat> I don't know, I just thought, uh, I thought there was a lot, probably a lot of truth to that observation that all of our decisions have something to do with our perception of status uh, in, in life. Mm -hmm. uh, whether it's a decision for good or bad, when we're called on to make a decision. Now, if our life is at stake, all bets are off, he says. You know, right. we're, we're, all decisions we make are going to be preserving our life. <laughs> <laughs> all that. Uh, but at any rate, I thought uh, I was reminded of that. Also on the hellbound train, Doc, uh, Glenn Orland was a, I don't know if he's still living or not, I haven't heard from him in, or about him in several years, but in the 60s when I lived in the Philadelphia area and was attending classes at the University of Pennsylvania Folklore, uh, he came, he was on the program, uh, we had a folklore society there at the University of Pennsylvania, and, and one month we had him 
uh, come to sing for us and to talk to us about folklore and folk life. He was from Stone County, Arkansas. And some of you will remember, that will clue you, that's Mountain View, Arkansas. That's where they have the big folk life festival that Jimmy Driftwood started a long time ago. I think he began on that in the 50s. And they still have a big, uh, not only folk music going on there, but they've got a folk life center there. If you spend time going around, if you've got a few days and you go to Mountain View, you know, you can go in and watch people making soap in the old way, huh. out in uh, wash pots and that sort of thing. Everything that people used to do, used to do in their home, you know, they've, they've got somebody who can still do that, you know, and they're, they're doing it when you walk in there. <laughs> That's cool. uh, and then, of course, you can buy some of the stuff if you want to. It, in, in other words, they're, they're trying to make their living that way. Uh, but Glenn Orland uh, had an album out at the time when he was performing for us, and he sang. And on the album, he's got where he, he does that Hellbound Train. Uh -huh. That was the only time, first time I'd ever heard of that song. And I think I don't think I'd heard of it until you mentioned it oh, again. Uh, tonight. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, I was I was impressed with with uh, Glenn Orland. O H R L. E N or I don't remember which, but uh, I suspect if he's still living, he's probably living in uh, Stone County, Arkansas. Uh, I've got a couple of poems that I want to share with you. One, I'm, I had this friend, neighbor, that I had met when I would be out mowing grass. I mow my own yard, and then uh, I've got a, there's a couple of lots that belong to my one to my granddaughter and one to my two sons. And when I get done mowing our yard, I go up and mow their yard because they don't have any, they don't live here and they don't have any houses on them now. And, you know, I told them, I've told them, I said, I, you know, I can, I'm happy to do this as long as I'm physically able. You know, I'm 84 and I don't have any trouble, you know, doing this kind of thing. I said, now, when I'm 94, I don't know whether I'm going <laughs> right. to do that or not. You may at some point have to make other arrangements for yeah. mowing to keep your lots mowed. But uh, at one time when I was out, in fact, several times when I was out mowing, their lots up there, this guy comes out, of the, kind of comes through the woods. There's a, a grove of trees that separate their lot from uh, one of the neighbor lots. And, he comes through the trees there, and you know I stop the mower, and we meet and greet and talk and become friends, and you know we visit with each other from time to time. Uh, and I like the guy, and it turns out he's a little bit younger than me. Uh, I think maybe four years or so younger, something like that. He, he, he at the time, and then he, we had a conversation just recently when I was out mowing and. Uh, and he was telling me that, you know, he started talking about his health and his age. And he had had a heart bypass back in July. Mm. And uh, my wife had had one of those in June. And I know that it took her a long time to get completely recovered. That I, I, I dare say maybe, you know, she's doing everything that she has ever done before. But for something that invasive, I don't think complete recovery for most people is more than a year. You know, in fact, I had one doctor one time say that uh, that it, it really takes about three years to completely recover. You're, you're, it's so invasive to your body that you don't you don't really have a complete recovery in every way until three years have passed. But this guy was telling me, he said, I haven't had that experience. He said, you know, I'm, I'm completely recovered. There's nothing I can't do now that uh, I could do everything. And, and he said, as a matter of fact, I would like to go back to work. You know, and he, by that he meant hard physical labor. And I said, well, Daryl, how old are you now? Are you about 80, aren't you? And he said, yeah. And he said, well, who would hire you, you know, even even if you were, were able to do it? And he said, well, I know at least one person that would hire me. Now, it turned out then that uh, I went back up there to see him about, he's got a backhoe, and I had a little project in mind for him. 
And I was going to ask him if he'd be available to use his backhoe on a little job. And he said, well, I haven't been feeling too good the last couple of weeks. But, you know, as soon as I'm feeling good again, we'll, you know, we'll, we'll talk about it and I'll get it done for you. And then the next thing I heard was from his daughter. And she said that he was in the hospital on a breathing tube. You know, he had, he had, had sudden... The reason he wasn't feeling good was he had something, some kind of gallbladder issue, mm. and he had to go in and have his gallbladder removed. And and he he never totally recovered, you know. He was uh, he had some sort of respiratory issue, and they had him on a breathing tube. And then I got word yesterday that he had died, oh, and that his uh, remote his memorial service going to be Monday, this coming Monday at Fellowship Baptist Church down uh, East Point across from the Ogburn Fire Department, uh, across right. the road from a, a little church called Fellowship Baptist. And that's where they'll have his memorial service. So I'll, I'll be going to pay my last respects to Darrell Mace Monday. Uh, but I was thinking, when I, was, when I learned that he had died, I thought of this poem. I think I read this some time ago. Uh, I got this. I learned. I got this poem from a guy named Richard Lee, who's a retired agriculture teacher, lives in Mount Vernon, and uh, he told me that his mother had forced him to learn this as a boy. You know, huh. learn it by heart. Yeah. And, and as well as other poems, you know, not at school. This was his mother who was forcing him to learn this. And it's called "The Last Leaf," L-E-A-F, "The Last Leaf," mm -hmm. by Oliver Wendell Holmes, Sr. And it goes as follows. I saw him once before as he passed by the door, and again the pavement stones resound as he totters over the ground with his cane. <laughs> they say that in his prime, ere the pruning knife of time cut him down, not a better man was found by the crier on his round through the town. But now he walks the streets, and he looks at all he meets, sad and wan, and he shakes his feeble head, that it seems as if he said, they are gone. <laughs> the money marbles rest on the lips that he has pressed in their bloom, and the names he loved to hear have been carved for many a year on the tomb. And then I thought uh, I wanted to share a poem from, this was a farmer that I met many, many years ago when I was a farm journal editor. We had this guy come to Philadelphia where I was, was our home office, and he was, his name is Michael Carey, C-A-R-E-Y, and he was a farmer from the state of Iowa. Some people would call Iowa the king of the farm states. Hmm. I think Michael would. A lot of people would. Uh, and this is a little poem that he, and he, read, he wrote all the poems in this book, as well as two or three other books. I don't remember. He had three or four books of poetry that he had written and had published. And, but I was always kind of partial to this, this poem. It's called The Thing About Farming. <laughs> the thing about farming is there is nothing between you and the world Everything you touch either wounds or responds. Everything you love touches back with food or with poison. <laughs> the thing about farming is nothing lasts for more than one season. For the rest of your life you plant and coddle and encourage. Still every winter all your children have gone. The thing about farming is you work most of your life alone, for better or for worse. <laughs> no God but the seasons, no lover but the earth, <laughs> no enemy but the weather and the wind. <laughs> the wind. The wind. <laughs> the thing about farming is you are responsible for a small portion of the planet. You keep it or you lose it and it changes no matter what. According to your efforts, 
But what's important is when you wake and pick blueberries, not only is the, are they good, they <laughs> are yours. The thing about farming is it's so easy. Half of it is learning to kill. The earth turns green each spring, regardless of your attentions. For every seedling you nourish, the rest of creation is weeds. <laughs> the thing about farming is it's not all food and abundance. Sometimes it is drought. Sometimes you get eaten by your own machinery. <laughs> the banks don't give you that loan and you go under. Sometimes you find a deer snagged on a fence and along with an underworld of stealth, you are drawn to the spot. <laughs> Curious about the carcass, its death, and your own. <laughs> nice. <laughs> Thank you. We'll conclude with our usual poem, uh, paragraph, uh, from the book How to Read a Poem and Fall in Love with Poetry by Edward Hirsch. In the final stanza of An Absence Devouring, Devouring Everything in Its Path, Sleep and Death, He sees death literally inside the beds where we sleep. All along it has been waiting for us to lie down for the last time so that our beds can become coffins and go sailing in a swelling procession into the other world which is overseen by nothing else but death itself. And Admiral Sola La Muerte, only death, death alone, nothing but death. In this visionary poem, Neruda has found a way to write about a mysterious presence that evades our understanding. We are mere residents on earth. The reader who uncorks the message in this particular bottle feels its surging waves of emotion, its strange playfulness, its dark undertow, and sweeping Oceanic power. <laughs> nice. Mm -hmm. we're, uh, for your information, oh, your whole stuff, Joe. We're down to page forty-one. All right. Oh, <laughs> Just rocking and rolling through that book. Mm -hmm. What well, What was your announcement that you had for this weekend? Oh, I have an announcement. <laughs> uh, day after, no, tomorrow night, Saturday night, at Tenney Chapel, the quintessential country church. Located okay, two miles south of Brookshire's on FM 312, then one fourth mile east on County Road 4620, is a little country church founded by my grandfather Ambrose Tenney in the February the 28th, 1900, and still perking along. <laughs> we will have something called Tenney Chapel Music Night. And there will be musicians performing from 6.30 to 8. 90 minutes of free family entertainment. Normally, our friend Doc Davis would be enter entertaining that night, but he has a conflict, a schedule conflict. Won't be there that night. But we have, after severe work and a lot of hard uh, recruiting, we've found a replacement. <laughs> so show up if you have nothing better to do. Um, I think this is going. This is our next to the last meeting. Yes, I've spoken. <clears throat> I've spoke to uh, Mary White at the, the center, at the art center. Uh, it's the possibility How do you of stop? Having them How do you stop this? Starting in July at the center. Stop it. Um, if there's no complex on Friday. Should right. they, on Friday should they have huh? no objection to this meeting okay. there? Um, yeah, if you want to do it a different night of the week, uh, which is less likely to have a conflict, you're welcome to do that. Uh, and, uh, that will be up to you. Uh, I'll still be in town, so I'll be attending them. Uh, it, is it is possible that I will still have uh, possession of the building in July, because I'm, I'm 
I want to keep the shop open through the end of June, which means I can't empty it out until it's closed. Otherwise, there'll be nothing left to sell by the end of July. So is June our last month here? So we may be, we may be able to be here in July. I won't know until okay. we, until we meet in June. I won't know. Julian, how do you stop? How do you stop it? We can't. It goes forever. It goes forever. How do you stop the <laughs> oh, record? Okay. Okay. Oh, good. Record button. Sorry. Fine. <laughs> I wanted to read my uh, edited 